normally I build these things from scratch. I, I go over the whole Python model, but I want to just go ahead and show you two programs that I made and walk you through them just so if you want to use them, that's how you can understand what's going on. Both of these were created for this uh, blog post on Wired. Um, could you strike out a major league player by pitching very slow? Written by, who wrote this? Oh yeah, I did. Ha! <laughs> that was funny. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you this program, and then I'm going to show you the physics, and then I'm going to show you the code. So let's zoom in on this a little bit and run it. Uh, this is my uh, just a basic model for a pitch and a strike zone, okay? And it's in 3D. So I have a couple of objects here, uh, and the, really the only one I want to focus on right now is the baseball. But here I have uh, the, the baseball and the trajectory. There's the, the pitching. What's that called? The, there's a wedge on the, home, on the pitching mound. That's what that is. And then there's the home plate, and then that's the strike, the strike uh, zone right there. Uh, it's that box. And yes, my plate is a square. It's not the correct size. Sorry about that. I could, you probably could make that, but let's just go over there. How do you model the motion of a, of a baseball moving through the air? And in this case, I wanted to do it as simple as possible and for slow balls, so I'm, I have no uh, rotation of the ball. There's no spin. Let's jump over to the paper and just write down the quick physics equations. I'll come back over here and I'll show you the code. Okay, so baseball. Suppose I have a baseball like that and it's moving with some velocity that way. And it's going to go like this. And I want to I want to find the trajectory of that baseball. Well, I need the forces on there, so I have the gravitational force mg, but then I also have to include the air drag force. If I throw this at a velocity of 90 miles per hour, which you know, baseball speeds for a major league pitcher, then there's going to be an air drag force. I'll call that F air like that. Now this force is pretty easy, right? Gravity, mg, and I can look at the mass of the ball, I can look at the radius of the ball and all that stuff. Uh, for the air drag, I'm going to use this model. F air is negative one half rho a c velocity squared v hat. This is important, the v hat, we've seen this model for drag where we have uh, the density of air rho, the cross-sectional area of the ball, that's this, you know, area. Um, the drag coefficient for a sphere, I can look this up. People have done a lot of physics on baseball, so that's pretty nice. Uh, the velocity magnitude squared, uh, if it's moving fast, in a non-viscous material. And then v hat, you have to include this unit vector here because I want this force as a vector so that I can write F net equals F air as a vector plus MG as a vector, and that's gonna be equal to MA, and then I can find the acceleration. But I need that as a vector. So as this thing moves down, the air resistance is actually gonna be pointed up a little bit. And once I find the, uh, the acceleration, I can break this into small time steps and use this for my acceleration. That gives me V2 equals V1 plus A delta T. So this says that the velocity at the beginning of the time interval, I can find the velocity at the end of the time interval if I know that acceleration. And then I can use the following for the velocity, delta R delta T, and this gives me R2 equals R1 plus V2 technically delta T. And again, we're assuming small time interval, so this is an approximation. And this is really good because Breaking this into small time steps is pretty much the only way to solve this trajectory for a ball moving in two dimensions with uh, V squared proportional air resistance. It's not really solvable, um, so that's fine. Okay, let's jump. Oh, and then I had my strike box. Um, I, I just basically, it's, it's the same size as uh, the plate, but it, it goes from the, the person's, I can't remember, it's like the mid, the mid chest to just below their knee or something like that. So let, let's look at the code, and I, I have a couple of fun things in here that we can look at. Okay, so we already saw that. Code, oh, that's not the, this code right here. Okay, code. So let's just go through everything in this code real quick. I'm gonna make this bigger, 
and make this smaller because you can't really see there um, and my face is blocking it that's fine okay let's make this uh, one yeah I like it nice and big okay so <clears throat> this is just some starting parameters about like um, the width that's the width of the home plate it's a square for me um, I was gonna try to it's actually a square with the corners cut out but I just made a square so that L2 doesn't really matter this is my unit conversion from feet to meters and then here's inches to meters because everything was given in uh, imperial units I don't know why so the home plate is just a box. Remember in WebVPython, we have these three-dimensional objects. It, it's a box. Uh, and and I'm, I have uh, the, the Y direction as my, my vertical direction. So I put it, um, why did I put nine? I just moved it to the side, right? Because when you place objects in Python, it's going to automatically zoom so it includes the origin. And I didn't want to do that. So it's a box. Um, and then that's the location. It's not that big of a deal. And then this pitching plate, that's the other box. So here I put L1 over 2. Oh, I need to shift it. Okay, this, this L1 over 2. Oh, because that's from the center of the box plus uh, H plate, the home plate, plus I need to shift it up. Oh, this is what I wanted right here. That's the distance, 60.5 feet to that pitching plate. And that's where I have that. And I converted it to, uh, and then it's also 10 inches above. I don't know. It's just, it doesn't really matter that much. And then the size doesn't really matter. RB, uh, that's the radius of the ball in meters. Uh, H is the, my estimated height of the strike zone from the from the human knee to the human plate, and it it changes for persons. So the strike zone is just that cube uh, shifted up above the plate. Okay, so it's the same size of the plate, uh, just a longer thing. And I did make this, I put it uh, partly transparent because I think that's cool. Now these points are really important. These are the uh, S Z X M. That's the minimum Z value in the X direction, the corner of the strike zone, right? I have that box. I'm looking for these corners, uh, and I'm just in the vertical direction. Then I have the X Z X max Z Z min Z Z max Z Y min Z Y max. So I need those points, those, those points in space. So I can see, does the ball pass through that box? Now I have my ball, I have a mass, drag coefficient, density of air, gravitational field, cross-sectional area. This is uh, converting from miles per hour to meters per second. Uh, and then I have my ball velocity in the X direction. And then I give it the momentum. Um, now this function I use later, this just says, is the ball, is it a strike? Really, is the ball in the strike zone? Does it is it in that box? So all I have to do is say, is the x value between these and the y values between these and the z value between these, and then if that's true, it's in there. Um, now here's the real physics. So this says while the the ball's still left of the home plate, uh, calculate the velocity. It's just the momentum divided by the mass. And so I normally do uh, F net is delta P delta T. And so, but the, but the air resistance depends on the velocity. So it's easier to just calculate the velocity. So that's what I did right there. And then this is the total net force. That's the same equation right there. Notice I have that norm ball V. That is the unit vector V hat. That's super important. If you don't have that, it just won't run, right? Because you have F as a, you're trying to add a scalar and a vector. It doesn't work. This is update the momentum, which is just like update the force, I mean the velocity. Update the position, update time, and then here's the fun part. If it's a strike, that box turns red. That's it. And then I print the final position of the ball for, for no reason. Um, so let's just go up here and run that. Boom. Now, we could change, this will be the fun part, change that initial velocity. I put it straight uh, in the x direction. But let's just give this an angle theta equals 
uh, let's say five degrees. So I'm going to tilt it up five degrees and you can't even see what I'm writing. Sorry about that. Uh, five degrees times pi divided by 180. And then this I'll just change to uh, cosine theta, sine theta, zero. And you could change in the z direction too, which would be left and right. Let's just run this and let's just see what happens. Uh, it should be fine though. Okay, not a strike, which is, I'm kind of surprised it's that much higher. Uh, let's change this to, I want a strike, one degree. Okay, that's a pretty good strike right there. See, it goes right through the box. Okay, cool. Now, the question was, I'm going to come back to this code. The question was, if I throw it at 40 miles per hour, what angle would I have to throw it at to get it to there? Now, let's go to my second program. I'm going to run it, and then we'll, I'll explain it. I, re I kind of like this one. So, this is a animation of the... Uh, trajectory of the ball. And so what I'm going to do is start with a 40 mile per hour throw. I'm going to increase the angle and this over here, these four dots, that's a side view of my strike zone. So let's run this. And see, so no strikes, then it strikes. I want to find out what angles I threw it at to get those strikes. And so you can see I actually printed them down out here. So that's what this, pro this program is to find those angles that I can throw it at in order to get a strike. And really the only way to do this is to throw the ball. So that's what I do. Let's go over the deets. Here I have, uh, this just makes a graph. That's all one line. I give it a title. I give it an X title, a uh, Y title. If you do an animated graph, you're going to want to put, and you want to make it look cool, you're going to want to put X max, Y max, uh, Y min in there. What that does is set the scale of the graph instead of auto scaling it. If you auto scale it, then things are going to zoom in and out and it's going to look whack. It's not going to look as pretty. Uh, so F1 is my my graph. I was going to have a dot showing where the ball was, but I, I took that off because I'm animating the whole path. Uh, and then F2 is just the dots for the strike zone, which you don't actually need. They're just there for fun. Uh, there's my same stuff. I copied a lot of the stuff from the previous program. Uh, actually H plate. Okay, so what I did do was I, I wanted to use the same thing, but I didn't want uh, the display. So I just turned H plate into a vector. It's not an object anymore. I turned the, the pitching plate into a vector. That's all I wanted from it anyway. So instead of saying H plate dot POS, I can say H plate. And that probably wasn't the best decision, but you know, we always make decisions that we don't really think are great afterwards. Uh, the strike zone again is a is a vector that's the center of the strike zone yeah again i changed the strike zone and which if you just started from scratch you wouldn't do that right but i wanted to use my old code and then i have these same corners of the thing uh, i plot those four corners uh, i find the starting position just like i did before i'm not using ball.pos i'm just using r uh, all that other stuff is the same the initial velocity the initial momentum uh, this is still that same initial, is it a strike? Uh, now I start with an angle of theta of zero and I change it. And here's my, how much do you change it by, right? So I'm going to run the trajectory. I'm going to plot it. I'm going to say, was it a strike or not? If it's a strike, print out the angle. And then I'm going to increase the angle and do it again. So I have a double loop here. At the beginning of the loop, uh, the rate 100 is important and you can't even see that. I'm just so excited. The rate 100 is important because that tells you how fast your animation is going to change. So if you make that a uh, 1,000, it's going to take a 10 times less to run. Now, at the beginning of each of these loops, after I change the angle, I need to reset the position. I need to reset the velocity. Okay, so that's what I'm doing in these two lines right here, resetting that, and time. And this F data is how you make an animated graph. If you want me to remake a video on animated graphs, I will do that. Okay, but what you do is you take all your data points and you put them in a list and then you plot it. You don't plot the data point each time. So I'll show you how to do that. And then I run it the same parameters for running the, the trajectory. Uh, I, this is the same stuff as before, calculating the numerical calculation, checking to see if it's a strike. You can have more than one strike per throw. It just means how many times, how many time intervals is it in there. And this part right here, which again, you cannot see, 
weird. Oh, you know what? I know what I did wrong. I was trying to make a different kind of video. Okay, so this part right here is where you, for the animated graph. So I have that thing called F data. It's a list. I'm going to add my data points to that list. So I want to plot X and Y. So I add a, a data point, which is a list X and Y, to my list. And then after the loop, I plot all the data at the same time. And that's how you make an animated graph, right? Because I don't want to animate the plotting of the graph. I want to plot the graph and then change the graph. And that's how you make it. it it's really kind of nice. I kind of like the way they do animated graphs in WebView Python. Um, I will give you the code down below, just so you know. There's two programs. And then it prints out the angle theta right there. Uh, no, it doesn't. Yeah, it prints out R. It, changed, it updates theta. It prints out theta if it's a strike. Okay, let's run this. So, strikes. And so you see here, I have strikes between an angle of, uh, oh, it goes a lot, 40, 30, 37, 35. Okay, let's do um, in the middle, let's do a 40 degree, a 40 degree angle should be a strike, right? That's what this says. So let's go back over here. Uh, I'm gonna change my speed to, what did I have it over here? I think I have my speed is at 40. V, zero, it's 30. Okay, 30 miles per hour, 40 degree angle. Let's go over here, 30 miles per hour, and an angle of 40. Right here. And now let's run it, let's see if it works. So this is with air drag, no curve. Is it gonna get it? Got it. Strike, if they'd swing and miss. But it went through the strike zone, so that's kind of cool. Um, so you can use this, there's a whole bunch of fun stuff. One of the things I was gonna do is kind of give a uh, probability distribution for the initial velocity. And so how, if I, if I have a, you know, a standard deviation in the velocity and it's a normal distribution, what percent of the balls are gonna be a strike for both the slow and the fast? Uh, is it more, is it easier to continue to get a strike with the fast or a slow? I'd never did that. Uh, one of the problems is that there's no normal distribution built into WebView Python. It's not too hard to put it in there, but you'd have to do that. And I'll make a video about that too. Um, yeah, so, and if you want to add in a curve, you could do that. It's not too terribly difficult. I've done that a couple of times, but it's really, uh, I don't think, if you're throwing it slow, you're, you're not going to be putting a curve on there anyway, so just, I didn't want to do that. Okay, so there you go. There are those two programs if you want to play with baseball trajectories. And you can make this a lot better. You could put uh, green uh, grass there and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, I'm really just looking for that graph. I just want to know if you could get a strike with slow speeds. So there you go.